Welcome to Norwich, the largest city in East Anglia, and the home of a wealth of riveting heritage and historic landmarks. On this 40-minute tour of the city centre, we'll uncover the story behind all of Norwich's main sites, the most famous of which is without doubt the immense Norwich Castle. First built in the year 1067 on the orders of William the Conqueror, Norwich Castle stands on a large mound at the heart of the city. At well over 900 years old, you'll forgive the cranes, carrying out vital restoration work to preserve what was once one of the greatest fortresses in England. Now home to Norwich Museum, the castle is one of the city's most popular visitor attractions, and it provides a window into Norwich's epic history. When it was built back in 1067, Norwich Castle had the largest mot of any castle in central England, and it was the only royal fort in East Anglia. Looming large over early medieval Norwich, the castle gave William the Conqueror an important base to cement his power over this region after his invasion of England, following his victory at the Battle of Hastings. But why exactly were Norwich and East Anglia so important to William? To understand, we need to take a look at a map and find out exactly where in the country Norwich is located. As you can see here, Norwich is located roughly 100 miles northeast of London and stands as the most important city in the famously rural region of East Anglia. However, back in the time of William the Conqueror, East Anglia was actually the most densely populated region in England which made it hugely politically significant. After his invasion, William needed to establish control in East Anglia if he was to consolidate power across the whole country. After all, even before William the Conqueror and the Normans arrived here, Norwich was already a place of significant settlement. The castle was built over the site of a grouping of local houses, as well as a Saxon era burial ground. Now almost nothing of pre-Norman Norwich remains today, but this city of around 200,000 people is still famed as the home of some of the most beautifully preserved medieval landmarks in England. From its towering cathedral to its spectacular guild hall, countless churches and many pubs, there's so much to see on a walk around Norwich, but it's also the go-to place for shopping in the region, with its many shops and markets attracting people from all over Norfolk. Here we find ourselves entering the gorgeous Royal Arcade, which was laid out back in 1899, and which is still home to many boutique outlets. An elegant Art Nouveau shopping arcade, the Royal Arcade was the work of an acclaimed architect from the nearby town of Deerham, George Skipper, who has been described as being to Norwich what Anthony Gaudi was to Barcelona. Now while Norwich admittedly doesn't attract the same levels of attention to its architecture as Barcelona, Skipper's architectural legacy is no small feat, having been the brainchild of many landmarks across Norwich and the wider county of Norfolk. But it's the Royal Arcade here that's perhaps the cleverest of all of George Skipper's works. The elegant shopping arcade, a popular trend in the late Victorian period built to protect shoppers from rain and soot out on the streets, incorporates an old local landmark that stood at the heart of medieval Norwich for centuries. As we walk out into the daylight again, looking up we can see the facade of an old inn, which was retained as the entrance to this end of the Royal Arcade. The inn was once known as the Angel, one of medieval Norwich's largest coaching inns, which was built in the 15th century, overlooking the historic home of trade in the city. Here, we're walking past the bustling Norwich Market, one of the largest and oldest outdoor markets in England. Held on this site at the heart of Norwich for over 900 years, the market was originally founded to supply Norman merchants who were moving into the city following the invasion of England in 1066. Over the centuries, the market has continued to grow and grow, with its labyrinthine rows of stalls still operating all these years later. We'll take a walk through the market in a few moments, 
But as the central point in Norwich for so long, the market came to be surrounded by some of the city's most important landmarks. On the north side of the marketplace here, we can see one of Norwich's most elegant medieval buildings, the beautiful 15th century Guildhall, which was built over the course of 17 years from 1407. At the time of its construction, Norwich's Guildhall was the largest and most elaborate city hall that had ever been built outside London, which tells us just how important a place Norwich was at the time. The Guildhall was used as the city jail early on in its life, as well as serving as the meeting place for the powerful local government, which had a then rare level of political autonomy. From the year 1404, Norwich was one of just a few places in England which had its own mayor, fostering an independence that drove Norwich to become the most advanced city in all of England. Just up beside the Guildhall, meanwhile, we find ourselves looking up at the immense new City Hall, which was opened back in 1938. An impressive building that looks over the city's central marketplace, Norwich City Hall is also rather interestingly home to the longest balcony in England and the largest clock bell in the UK. But while those quirky claims to fame are all well and good, we did just make a rather bold claim about Norwich having at one point been the most advanced city in England. But what exactly does that mean? Well, in contrast to the partly isolated way in which some outsiders see the city today, Norwich was once a leading light in the world of English politics. In the late medieval and early modern era, Norwich prided itself on religious and political freedom, and the city is arguably responsible for so many liberties that we take for granted today. We'll talk much more about that as we continue to explore the city, but we now find ourselves at the foot of the Church of St Peter Mancroft, which was built in the mid-15th century. The Church of St Peter Mancroft is a central icon of medieval Norwich, and it's actually the largest church in Norwich after its two cathedrals. That's quite the feat in Norwich more than anywhere else in the country, as this city is world famous for its wealth of medieval churches, with at least 58 located within the bounds of the old medieval walls. There are churches of all different shapes and sizes on pretty much every corner of this captivating city, just a few of which we'll encounter on our walk today. But down beside the medieval church of St Peter Mancroft, we see an example of far more modern architecture in Norwich, the Forum, a huge community centre built in 2001. The Forum was built as a replacement for the old Norwich Library, which burnt down in 1994, now playing host to a new city library, as well as a cafe, a restaurant, information centre and more. There are a few cities in the country with quite as striking a range of architecture as Norwich, and this shows us just how long this city has been a place of national significance. As we mentioned when passing the castle, Norwich was the site of significant settlement long before the arrival of the Normans, with the city always having been a key regional centre. But as long as 2,000 years ago, Norwich lay just five miles north of the capital of the native Britonic Iceni tribe, whose iconic queen you'll likely have heard of. The Iceni and their queen Boudicca have become enduring symbols of British resistance to the Roman invasion of Britain, which began in the year AD 43. Shortly afterwards, Boudicca led a legendary uprising in AD 60 against the occupying forces of the Romans, although the native tribes were ultimately defeated with as many as 80,000 tribes people killed, including Boudicca herself. And it was roughly 900 years after Boudicca's revolt that Norwich Market was first held here, as the Normans began to arrive into the region. While the local market for the Saxon settlement had been held elsewhere, this new, larger market was established to supply the city's growing Norman population. With the development of the market here, Norwich began to see a rise in fortunes, by the 14th century growing to become one of England's richest trading centres. In the 20th century, however, Norwich Market experienced a period of gradual decline, 
and it wasn't until 2006 that the market was rebuilt to its current form. With many stalls open seven days a week, the market remains one of England's largest, oldest and most active, surrounded by enthralling history that brings the story of Norwich to life. The Guildhall, for example, was deliberately built beside the market to allow the Mayor of Norwich to keep an eye on the activity and trade that was powering the city. As we mentioned, the Mayor was a symbol of medieval Norwich's outstanding degree of political autonomy, an independence that was conferred to the city due to its strong commercial and industrial power. Among the most thriving industries in medieval Norwich was wool production, a typical driver of growth in England at the time. The wealth brought in by wool produced in and around Norwich funded local construction projects, giving birth to the vast majority of Norwich's most famous buildings that still stand today, most notably its many churches. The building of so many churches became a symbol of Norwich's importance, with a frankly ludicrous density that remains a distinctive feature of the city today. Here, we find another medieval church, St John's, which is neighboured by the Belgian monk pub to our left. The pub and church here make up a classic Norwich scene, as the city is home to one of the highest densities of churches and pubs in the entire world. Along with the 58 churches built inside the old medieval walls, as many as 600 pubs have existed in Norwich over time. That's why it's long been said that Norwich has a pub for every day of the year and a different church for every Sunday. Nowadays, the number of pubs in Norwich has dropped to about 130, while its many churches have been wonderfully preserved. And as we continue our walk around Norwich, we'll see many more churches and pubs, including one of the oldest inns in England, which dates back to the 13th century. But we're now making our way down St John's Alley, named after the church behind us, and which brings us out onto the edge of central Norwich, onto a street home to some distinctive historical landmarks. This street, known as Charing Cross, is the home of the 14th century Strangers Hall, one of Norwich's oldest buildings. Built all the way back in 1320, the yellow-coloured hall we can see across the road was once the home of Nicholas Southerton, the mayor of Norwich in the 16th century, and whose deeds gave the building its name. The Strangers' Hall is named from the fact that Southerton used to use his home as a refuge for foreigners, or strangers, who arrived in Norwich after escaping persecution. These so-called strangers came mostly from modern-day Belgium and the Netherlands, as they were fleeing Spanish rule in the 16th century. The arrival of the strangers had a big impact on Norwich, however, as many of them were cloth weavers who brought their trade to the city. We'll talk more about that shortly, but just behind the strangers' hall, we find another church, St Gregory's, most of which was built in the 14th century, although its tower and other parts are even older. But it's one of so many beautifully preserved buildings to be found in Norwich. As we'll see later on, a good proportion of Norwich's historic churches have ceased to be used for prayer, but they've taken on a wide range of new uses, from museums to art centres and more, which keep the city's beautiful old buildings in working order. Back on the main road beside the Strangers' Hall, meanwhile, we can see the Strangers' Tavern, a slightly more modern pub which took its name very recently in 2019, in homage to the building beside it. You'll see the name of the Strangers pop up all over Norwich, signalling the influence that they've had over the city for such a long time. But exactly what kind of influence did they have? Passing by the Strangers' Hall once again, 
where many took refuge from around 1567, it's said that the strangers were widely welcomed by the people of Norwich. This was significant, as the strangers were mainly Protestants, but England had spent the last few decades gripped by religious turmoil and tension. However, with greater autonomy from the policies of the Crown, Norwich didn't quite have the same levels of sectarianism between Protestants and Catholics, meaning that the influx of a large community of foreign Protestants didn't heavily destabilise the city. And the warm reception of the strangers by Norwich locals was a big part of why they were able to establish themselves in the city so well, as they began to ply their trade of cloth weaving. Cloth weaving was already a widespread industry in Norwich and the wider region, but the strangers brought with them a fresh perspective and new, exotic weaving techniques that bolstered weaving in Norwich, helping the city to grow even further in stature, to the point that it actually became a fundamental centre of England's trade with continental Europe. Positioned on the eastern side of England, Norwich has always had strong trade links with nations in mainland Europe, and the city developed far-reaching trade as it worked in partnership with the Norfolk coastal town of Great Yarmouth, which acted as a seaport for Norwich's exports. Products made in Norwich were exported around Europe, but the city's strongest trade links were with the Netherlands, a bond that was further solidified by the arrival of the Strangers in the 16th century. The Strangers in Norwich made up one of the largest Dutch communities in Britain at the time, not only playing a key role in the development of local industry and trade, but also in the birth of a modern-day symbol of Norwich, the Canary. Canaries were kept as pets right across Europe, and as the strangers continued to make their way across the North Sea from the continent, they brought their pets with them. From there, canaries were bred locally for the first time in England, becoming an enduring symbol of the city of Norwich, even appearing on the crest of Norwich City Football Club, as depicted here. Establishing a major community in Norwich, the mostly Protestant strangers adopted this church above us as their principal place of worship. This is St Andrew's Church, built at the turn of the 16th century, and which developed as one of the main preaching houses in Norwich through the century, evolving into the second largest non-cathedral church in the city. St Andrew's was a stronghold of Protestant worship, and some of its preachers even found themselves emigrating to America on the Mayflower in 1620. Down beside St Andrews on this side, meanwhile, stands an even older building known as the Bridewell. The Bridewell dates back to the year 1370, and while it now houses a city museum, it served many purposes through time acting as a jail, a shoe factory, and much more. The Bridewell lends its name to Bridewell Alley here, but the building was also once home to a figure of local legend in Norwich. In the 18th century, the Bridewell was home to Peter the Wild Boy, a young boy whose story spread far and wide across Britain. Peter was a young boy who was brought to England after he had been found living wild in the forests of Germany. After arriving in this country, Peter was kept as a kind of curiosity by King George III, but he later mysteriously turned up in Norwich, being taken into care at the Bridewell, which stands just beside this pub, The Wild Man, which owes its name to the story of Peter the Wild Boy. Passing by The Wild Man, we find ourselves at the foot of an elegant white stone building that dates to 1925, formerly used as a branch of the National Provincial Bank from its construction until 1973. The building was later used as the Norwich City office and is today the home of a rather ornate restaurant, lovingly restored in the late 2010s and returning the old bank to its status as a striking landmark in this historic city. 
The building stands over London Street, which takes us away from the marketplace and busy heart of Norwich towards some of the city's best preserved medieval areas, from the gorgeous Elm Hill to the masterful Cathedral Quarter, all of which we'll see as we continue our walk. Interestingly though, London Street here was the first shopping street in the UK to be pedestrianised, with the conversion taking place back in 1967, setting the standard for many easily walkable British city centres today. You could take that as another example of Norwich streaking ahead with modern, advanced ideas, in similar vein to the city's long history of forward-thinking developments. However, while pedestrianised city centre streets have in recent years proved to be a widely popular development, there was a point in history where forward planning proved not to be Norwich's strong point. As a burgeoning medieval city with immense political significance, particularly across East Anglia, Norwich became encircled by a series of defensive walls built over a number of decades from 1294 to 1343. But as we pass by another medieval church, St Michael at Plea, the city's medieval walls soon began to cause problems for Norwich, as the economic boom we've discussed saw the city begin to swell in population and therefore size. The city walls, which encircled an area covering roughly a square mile, acted as a barrier to expansion, and so developers in Norwich began trying to cram everything for a major medieval metropolis into a tiny space. Development in Norwich was contained within the walls for a long period of time, and for over 400 years until the 1780s, not a single house was built outside the walls, despite the city's population skyrocketing over the same period. By 1662, Norwich had evolved into England's second most populous city after London. But while London continued to spread out from its central square mile, Norwich's population remained packed inside the historic city walls. It's said that the presence of the walls as the Industrial Revolution got underway was detrimental to Norwich's industrial development. But the walls are also the reason that the city centre was built so packed with medieval churches as here we find ourselves looking at St Peter Hungate, yet another 15th century church. With the church on what feels like every corner of the city, it goes to show just how essential churches were to Norwich's medieval population, almost all of whom attended church services every single week. And just across from St Peter Hungate stands St Andrews and Blackfriars Hall, part of a huge friary complex. Blackfriars Hall was built in the 14th century, and it makes up some of the most complete remains of a medieval monastery that you'll find in England today, built with a capacity for over 1,200 people and squeezed into this cramped corner of central Norwich. But it's among these narrow medieval streets that we find one of the most beautiful parts of the city. Here, we're standing opposite the Britain's Arms, which was built back in 1347, and which was once an alehouse standing on one of Norwich's most famous streets. The Britain's Arms is said to be the oldest building on Elm Hill, a street that was once lined with medieval houses of the same period, but all of which are long since gone, owing to a devastating fire that ripped through Elm Hill and the rest of Norwich in 1507. The cobbled Elm Hill here was decimated by the fire, but as an important thoroughfare linking the heart of the city with Norwich Cathedral, where we're headed now, the street was swiftly rebuilt during the Tudor period, lined with timber-framed houses that now characterise one of Norwich's most bewitching lanes. From the cobbles to the Tudor-era houses, Elm Hill is a wonderfully atmospheric lane that's become a beloved Norwich landmark, compared with some of the most beautiful streets in Britain, including the Shambles in York and Steep Hill in Lincoln. As a famously scenic spot, Elm Hill has also starred in a number of films and TV shows in recent years. But long before then, this street was a thriving part of Norwich's busy weaving industry. The street was known as the home of some of the wealthiest wool merchants in Norwich, who built workshops for their businesses nearby. The wool trade pushed Norwich's prosperity towards its peak in the 18th century, at which point Elm Hill was considered among the most exclusive parts of the entire city, 
but it wouldn't stay that way. By the 20th century, weaving had begun to decline, and Elm Hill too had fallen from grace, degenerating into a slum area, which seemed beyond saving. In order to revive the area, developers in the 1920s aimed to demolish Elm Hill and replace it with new houses. But the plans fortunately never went through, and Elm Hill soon returned to glory as an eye-catching historic lane. Beautifully preserved over the last century, Elm Hill is still home to shops and some lovely houses, while this end of the street is punctuated by, you guessed it, a medieval church, the Church of St Simon and St Jude, which was built in the 14th century. Having now walked along Elm Hill, we followed the path that many people would have taken when passing across the city. The commercial heart of Norwich, located around the castle and the marketplace, was historically known as the French Borough, in reference to the Norman settlers who developed the area. But on this eastern side of the city, the Normans also built a spectacular, enormous cathedral, located roughly in the original pre-Norman centre of Norwich. Just up ahead of us at the end of this road is the area known as Tombland. Tombland was the centre of Norwich in the Anglo-Saxon period, serving as the site of the town's markets. In fact, that's where the area gets its distinctive name, with Tombland simply referring to an open space on which markets were held. The arrival of the Normans and the development of the French borough soon saw the heart of Norwich shift a few streets away, but Tombland by no means became neglected. Over the last few centuries, Tombland was actually the place where many important visitors would stay. Here, we're looking towards the Maid's Head Hotel, which claims to be the oldest hotel in the UK, dating back over 800 years. Over all that time, the hotel has hosted guests including Catherine of Aragon, Henry VIII's first wife, the Black Prince, son of King Edward III, and even Queen Elizabeth I herself. Alongside the historic Maid's Head Hotel, a number of exclusive houses and inns were built, giving Tombland a particularly dignified character in the bustling city of Norwich. But it's also the home of Norwich Cathedral, one of the most important landmarks in the city's history, which is accessed through this beautiful gateway, the Erpingham Gate, built in 1420. The gate gives access to the cathedral close, but we won't walk through to look at one of England's largest cathedrals just yet, as we've still got more to explore in Tombland. Even after the market moved away from here to the French borough, Tombland was still a bustling centre for the city, hosting many local fairs through the years. The fairs were major occasions in medieval Norwich, but on one occasion, a fair hosted in Tombland caused absolute chaos. A fair of 1272 erupted into violence and rioting, the peak of a long-running dispute between Norwich locals and monks in the cathedral priory over land rights. A series of false claims and squabbles led to the clash, in which locals from roughly this position began firing burning arrows over the walls into the cathedral close, which caused heavy damage to the priory, the cathedral, and even the total destruction of St Ethelred's church, which was located inside the close. This conflict went on for a while, until King Henry III was forced to step in to resolve matters. He blamed the people of Tombland for the violence, and to repent for their actions, they were ordered to build a new gate leading from Tombland into the cathedral close. And that was this very gate, built in 1325 by locals on the site of the destroyed St Ethelred's Church. 
The gate is today known as St Ethelred's Gate after the church that once stood here. And as well as serving as an important entrance to the cathedral close from Tombland, a chapel was built on the upper floor of the gate as a replacement for the former church. Having stood here for nearly 700 years, St Ethelred's Gate remains one of Norwich's most exquisite medieval landmarks, leading the way to the cathedral, which is one of the icons of the city. We now find ourselves inside the cathedral close, and just ahead we can see the spectacular towering spire of Norwich Cathedral, which, much like the castle where we began our walk, was built by the Normans. The cathedral, with its soaring spire that towers over the city's skyline, is regarded as one of the greatest Norman era buildings in England, compared with the legendary Durham Cathedral that began construction in roughly the same era. Norwich Cathedral, given its size, took a long time to build, constructed over the course of half a century from the year 1096, beginning what has gone on to stand as by far one of the largest cathedrals in the country, featuring one of England's tallest and most striking spires. The spire reaches to an immense height of 315 feet or 96 metres above ground, which makes Norwich Cathedral the fourth largest church building in the UK. But surrounding the cathedral is also one of the largest cathedral closes in all of Europe, in which we find this statue of the famous Vice Admiral Horatio Nelson, one of Britain's greatest naval commanders, and who was actually born in Norfolk in the village of Burnham Thorpe back in 1758. But Nelson isn't the only historic military figure remembered in Norwich's cathedral close. This is the part of the close that you'd arrive into if you walked through the Erpingham Gate, which we saw earlier, and which takes its name from Sir Thomas Erpingham. Erpingham was a major figure in England's medieval army, serving as the leader of England's archers at the Battle of Agincourt against France in 1415. A common story is that the famous two-finger salute used in Britain originates from archers at the Battle of Agincourt, as a way of mocking captured French archers, whose index and middle fingers were cut off so they couldn't pull their bows. That story isn't thought to be true though, but what is true is that Sir Thomas Erpingham returned to Norwich after Agincourt and took charge of building the gate that bears his name. He died in 1428 and was laid to rest inside Norwich Cathedral. Now Norwich Cathedral isn't the only historic institution that you'll find in the city's 44 acre large cathedral close. As we mentioned, the close was once home to a priory but today encloses houses, gardens, and even a historic school. The buildings beside us here are part of Norwich School, one of the oldest and best schools in the UK, which was founded by the Bishop of Norwich in 1096, the same year as the cathedral. Over the centuries, Norwich School has been located in various places around the city, but since 1551, its home has been the cathedral close here. But as we mentioned, Norwich Cathedral Close also includes a residential area, with a range of houses and a considerable population of its own. There are more people living inside Norwich Cathedral Close today than any other cathedral close in the world. Of course, the Cathedral Close's size, being one of Europe's largest, is a reason for that. But as we pass by some of the beautiful houses and a picturesque green used by residents, it's not the only reason that this has become a popular part of Norwich to live. Conveniently located just a short walk from both the city centre and Norwich railway station, the Cathedral Close offers an oasis of tranquility in Norwich. But as well as convenience, living within the Close also affords some rather lovely views of the local architecture. The sleekly designed, creamy coloured medieval cathedral is without doubt one of England's most beautiful buildings, constructed with Comte limestone brought across from Normandy in modern day France. But despite the cathedral's pristine appearance today, the building has been through a fair few dramas over its more than 900 year history. 
One such incident was of course the effects of the burning arrows fired into the cathedral closed by locals during the Tombland Riots of 1272. But that wasn't the first time that Norwich Cathedral suffered damage. In fact, in the year 1169, just two years after the cathedral had been fully completed from its original construction, its spire was hit by a bolt of lightning, which caused a major fire to spread across the building. The fire damage was swiftly repaired soon after, but it seems that lightning did strike twice for Norwich Cathedral. In 1463, the spire was destroyed during a lightning storm, again setting off a fire across the whole cathedral building. The heat of the blaze then was in fact so intense that much of the creamy limestone exterior turned a pink colour. Once again though, Norwich's grandest landmark was repaired, and in 1480, the spire that we see today was erected, still standing proud over the city. Having now made our way around the cathedral itself, we find ourselves in a rather calmer part of central Norwich, with the city's cathedral quarter here offering a lovely place to escape the hustle and bustle of the narrow lanes which we've spent so much of our tour walking through. But while this part of the city may be quieter, it's no less historic, as many of the streets, walls and buildings of this area are among the oldest in all of Norwich. Walking out of the cathedral closed now, we'll make our way towards the 13th century Adam and Eve pub, the oldest tavern in all of Norwich, located by the River Wensum, where we'll be ending our walk in a couple of minutes time. On our way towards the Adam and Eve however, there's more heritage to be uncovered in the cathedral quarter beside the grand building that stands at its heart. Up ahead, we can see the small St Helens Church, which at its oldest dates back to the year 1375, but which stands on the site of a chapel that existed at least a hundred years before then. That makes St Helens one of the oldest sites of worship in all of Norwich, again no mean feat in this city filled to the brim with churches. But the pleasant historic streets of the cathedral quarter here haven't just played a part in Norwich's religious history, but also in the city's economic development. As we mentioned earlier, Norwich as a city has had a long history of overseas trade, in particular dealing in wool with the Netherlands just across the North Sea. But despite being a bustling centre of weaving and commerce, Norwich is located roughly 20 miles inland, and so has always required reliable links to the coast to keep its economy pushing ahead. That link came in the form of the local river Wensum, which bends around the cathedral quarter here, and on which boats carrying the produce made by Norwich's weavers would navigate towards the coastal port of Great Yarmouth. The Wensum was once teeming with trade that drove Norwich's historic prosperity, and although it's today a much calmer river, you'll encounter all manner of riveting history as you walk along its banks. Over time, many of the strangers built houses along the banks of the Wensum, while a number of historic structures from the Cow Tower to Pools Ferry also tell the story of Norwich's riverside settlement. We won't quite have time to walk along the river to see those structures today, although they're certainly worth the visit if you've got more time in Norwich. But here, we find ourselves approaching the Adam and Eve, probably the oldest public house in Norwich. Dating all the way back to 1249, this quaint medieval pub has stood on the edge of this majestic city for much of its history, and is closely linked to the historic religious quarter that surrounds it. Originally, the Adam and Eve was the place where workmen building and repairing Norwich Cathedral would come to quench their thirst, but over time, this pub has become a bit of a local institution. It was slightly expanded in the 15th century, but while the Adam and Eve is still noticeably small today, there's a lot of history to be found within its walls, having been through wars, rebellions, and even said to have been haunted by a number of ghosts over the centuries. Having stood here in Norwich for 773 years, the Adam and Eve is thought to be one of the oldest pubs in England, and you can see just how much times have changed since it was first established. The tiny front door for one, 
seems to show us just how much people have grown over the last seven centuries. But despite its legendary age, the Adam and Eve, like many of Norwich's spectacular medieval landmarks, is still standing and still operating to this very day. Sadly though, it's here that we've reached the end of our walk around Norwich. Once upon a time, the most advanced city in England, there's so much enthralling, beautifully preserved history to be discovered on a walking tour of Norwich. Thank you so much for watching this video. I really hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you're now looking forward to making a trip to Norwich to explore its bounty of historical treasures sometime soon. Thank you very much for tuning in to this tour of the magnificent city of Norwich. If you've made it this far, you'll hopefully have gained the same fondness for the city that I have. Now this video has been very kindly sponsored by Big Red Egg, who produce a range of gift items, including a range of Norwich and Norfolk themed presents, including everything from mugs to cushions, posters and more. So go to BigRedEgg.com to check out a fantastic range of products, where you can also get a 10% discount on any order with the code NORWICH. Thank you again to Big Red Egg, and thanks to you for watching this video.